Good morning. I'm Vicar Mary Button. Welcome to Online Worship with Redeemer Lutheran Church. It is the second Sunday in Lent, and we're so happy to have you here with us this morning. Um, I'd like to personally invite folks to join me Monday nights at 7 o'clock p.m. throughout Lent on Zoom to study the Stations of the Cross and to share stories from the pandemic. We had our first gathering this past Monday, and it was a really lovely time. Um, more info has gone out via email and uh, has also been in the chimes. But if you have any questions, you can email me at vicarmarybutton at gmail.com. And as always, you are invited to join us for Holy Communion on Zoom at 11 a.m., followed by Social Hour uh, today, Sunday. Uh, this is always a great time to share in the Lord's Supper together um, and to also check in on our friends and neighbors. We are profoundly grateful to everyone who has continued to give. If you are watching this on our website, you can give online right here. Um, you can also mail your checks directly to the church office. To learn more about Redeemer Lutheran Church and the good work that we're up to in our community, please visit RedeemerKingston.org. Thanks for being with us today. reading from Genesis. Then Abraham fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of multiple nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. 
kings of peoples shall come from her. Thus ends the reading. reading from Romans. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all Abraham's descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, in the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the death and calls to existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Thus ends the reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, 
and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. That's from verses 34 and 35 of today's lesson. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. I think a lot about what it means to be disciples, what it means to be followers of the Lord Jesus, what it means to be the church. I don't have any magical answers or solutions except to fall back on what I know, what I've been doing for almost 40 years. All of us could say that in the church. So the two congregations that I serve, most of you are watching from these two congregations, Redeemer and Trinity, have done church, I think, pretty well. Focus in on worship as one of the primary aspects of church life, and for good reason. We tend to do church pretty well. Lutheran Christians are uh, people that love worship. Liturgy, the work of the people as it's defined is wonderful, beautiful. Music, rich heritage of music that goes back centuries or might have been even written yesterday. More contemporary uh, music as well. The organ is a beautiful instrument, piano, perhaps other instrument, instruments at times too. Singing, choirs, choruses, wonderful soloists. I love to preach, absolutely love to preach. Not particularly crazy about preaching into the little dot on the top of my computer screen, but hopefully someday soon that will be, begin to change. Back to the good old days. Back to the days of being back in church together, hopefully, after this pandemic. But we're good at church in that aspect, worship. Uh, I love presiding at communion. I view church as a way in worship, as a way to be fed, to be fed by the word, to be fed by the meal. Church is also a place where we baptize. Church is also a place where we uh, provide Sunday school. Church is a place where we provide the rite of confirmation, the journey of faith to be disciples of the Lord Jesus. They're all good things. They're all wonderful things. They're all things that I have enjoyed for almost 40 years. And yet, if I'm honest with myself, that is not the church. It's an aspect of the church, big C. And worship, as important as it is, and those rites of passage, spiritually, as important as they are, are a portion of what the church, big C, means. Jesus formed the church. But he formed the church out of disciples. He formed the church out of followers. And what he taught his followers really have nothing to do, in large part, with what we do today as the church. And that sounds contradictory, but it's also true. Jesus never asked us to worship him, ever. I can't find any place in the Gospels where that's the case. 
Jesus did talk about worship, especially his heavenly father, with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. But other than that, I don't see any aspect of it. When Jesus went to the synagogue, he went to the synagogue to teach. Most often when Jesus went to pray, he went on the mountaintop or in the desert. In other words, Jesus' view of what it means to be the church, I think, is different than how we might define the church. Now, I'm not saying what we do is a bad thing. I don't believe that, or I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. What we do is good. There's nothing wrong with it. Again, worship is a time to be fed and nourished and to celebrate with each other and be a community. Those are wonderful things in all other aspects. And truthfully, we have to view the church in some ways like a business because it does operate in some ways like a business uh, with money and salaries and payroll and expenses. And we have property. We have the church itself, the nave and sanctuary, and other buildings too that we need to take care of. Uh, that all makes perfect sense. But all of this combined do not form discipleship. There are parts of it, but they're not. Mission has to be the focus. Now, if you argue, if you want to say to me and argue to the point that, wait, wait a second, Taylor, we do aspects of ministry. Yes, absolutely. No doubt about it. So Redeemer and Trinity have a history of doing mission and ministry work in the community. At Redeemer, uh, we have a portal ministry and where there's uh, low income housing provided uh, along with Rubco. And so that, that's an important aspect of, of ministry and of extension of that ministry and mission in the community. Trinity has a food pantry. And so we at Trinity offer that as a way to help people who run short of food. And God knows in this pandemic, that is even more true now more than ever. Both congregations have participated in the backpack ministry along with Emmanuel, an important aspect of making sure that young children are fed and get the, uh, the things that they need to survive in life. And we've had members from all three congregations participate in that. And that's a wonderful ministry. Uh, Pre-COVID, all three congregations also participated in providing meals, making meals for the warming center. And since COVID restrictions have kind of kept that at bay, I, my guess is at some point that will pick up again. They're all really important things, wonderful things. And um, it, it's, it's fine and good and needed. And yet, as a pastor, and I, I've been part of this for 40 years, that doesn't define discipleship. It's a part of. So what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is as we look to the future of the church, of which we're all anxious, especially during these times of COVID-19, what is the future? Well, right now, Redeemer and Trinity are sharing my position, the role of a pastor, because of financial concerns. That is not only the future, it is the now. Not only in our synod, but across the ELCA and across denominational lines. It's just the fact. We bemoan the fact that more young people don't come to church. Okay? Um, and we might say, well, you know, maybe their parents weren't involved in church or maybe this or maybe that, or they have other interests. But we also have to look at ourselves and go, why do young people not come to church? Have we ever asked them? Um, not that we don't have any young people that go to church, we do, but you know where I'm going on this. Many of us as parents or grandparents can look at, at our children and grandchildren and kind of wonder, will they ever be part of a church? As a pastor, Cheryl and I have two beautiful, wonderful uh, children. They're adults, 35 and 31. They're really good people, a good man, a good woman. Our daughter's married to a man who we consider another son. Uh, our daughter's expecting our first grandchild. Um, at the end of June, we're excited as grandparents. In other words, our kids are good citizens. They have good friends. They have excellent work ethics. They're wonderful people. Um, they were baptized um, 
by uh, two different bishops. Uh, they were confirmed by me. Their dad is the pastor. I'm sure they were thrilled about that one. But neither of them go to church today. That's not a judgment. I'm sure many of you could <clears throat> look at children and grandchildren and say the same thing. Um, and why is that? Well, there's also kind of sort of factors involved in that. But I did ask my daughter one day uh, a few years ago, what would bring you back to the church? What would uh, make you say, you know, I'd like to be part of a faith community wherever um, she might live? And she said something interesting to me. She said, Dad, she said, <clears throat> worship is wonderful and what the churches do are, are wonderful. But I think the main thing is a centralized, focused mission in the community to really address the specific needs and make that a main focus. And everything else is secondary. That's basically the conversation we had. And you know, I couldn't disagree with that. And as much as, again, as I love worship and I love aspects of church life that I've been part of for 40 years, I think discipleship is exactly that. It's in serving others. And that is not only a part of what discipleship is, it is discipleship. And then we use worship as a supplement to feed ourselves, to go out into the community, to love and to serve. In my favorite written sermon, actually there's two, one is called You Are Accepted by theologian, Luther theologian Paul Tillich. And the other one is called The Church by Presbyterian minister Fred Beekner. And in his sermon, The Church, Beekner focuses in on discipleship and what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And some of you have heard this before, and you'll probably hear it again because I think it's that important. For me, it needs to sink into my cell membranes in my head. Um, and I hope it means the same for you. He writes that church is family. <clears throat> and that is what Jesus has called us as the church to be. Our happiness is all mixed up with each other's happiness and our peace with each other's peace. Our own happiness, our own peace can never be complete until we find some way of sharing it with people into the way things are now, have no happiness and no, no peace. In other words, to serve others in desperate need. Beekner goes on, Jesus calls us to show this happiness, to show this truth, excuse me, to show this truth forth, live this truth forth, be the light of the world, he says. Where there are dark places, be the light especially there. Be the salt of the earth. Bring out the true flavor of what it is to be alive truly. Be truly alive. Be life givers to others. That is what Jesus tells the disciples to be. That is what Jesus tells his church, tells us to be and do. Love each other. Heal the sick, he says. Raise the dead. Cleanse lepers. Cast out demons. That is what loving each other means. If the church is doing things like that, then it is being what Jesus told it to be. If it is not doing things like that, no matter how many other good and useful things it may be doing instead, then it is not being what Jesus told it to be. It is as simple as that. It is that simple and yet that complex. How do we change the structure of what it means to be the church? I don't think we have to. Again, worship is a central core and aspect of what we do. That's what we're doing right now. And that's important, again, to be fed, to be nourished, to go out and, and to serve. But sometimes I think we get caught up, and I'm as guilty as anybody, of getting caught up in the minutia of what it means to be the church. We get caught up in all the busyness, the finances, the property issues, which are imp very important. Let's be honest, but 
when we get caught up in those things and get caught up into the little infightings that go on in any congregation. It takes away that energy that we need to be followers of the Lord Jesus, that we need to be Jesus' eyes and ears and hands and feet in a world that so desperately needs us, so desperately needs that God's love extended into that world. Jesus' journey to the cross was simply, as John Shea defines it, extending God's love into the world no matter what would happen to him. That's, that's what discipleship is, is doing that. And that has to be the chief core element of what we do. If it is not, then we just simply keep going on with what we've been doing. And we see where that has gotten us. And yes, there are churches that are bigger and they have more people and more money and people and more money tend to generate more people and more money. Um, and so, yes, there are those that we can look to and go, wow, that church is really big and surviving and thriving. And what are we doing wrong? It, it, it's not that we're doing anything wrong. It's that maybe, and again, I'll point to myself, maybe our eye was taken off the ball maybe a long time ago in terms of making the focus of what we do as followers, extending God's love into that world. So that's all. Just wanted to have a conversation today about discipleship, what it means. I welcome your comments. I welcome your concerns. I welcome your thoughts about the future. Um, I'm hopeful. I'm optimistic. I tend to be. I don't think I'm a pessimist, but I'm also a realist too. And I know that we don't know what the future holds. I think living through this pandemic has taught us that. But we also know kind of what Jesus wanted the church to be. All we have to do is pick up the Gospels, read them, and see. Yeah, times are different. Things are different. Socioeconomic conditions in many ways are different too. But where do we put our ecclesiastical eggs in what basket? Where do we put the emphasis of what we do and who we are as followers of the Lord Jesus? All open questions, but something for each of us to think about for now and for the future of the church as well. Blessings and peace be with you all. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all who are in need. All the ends of the earth worship you. From galaxies to microorganisms, preserve your creation. Teach humanity to wonder at your works and to join you in tending to creation's well-being. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You rule over the nations. Raise up advocates for peace and justice within and between nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities we cannot even imagine. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In Jesus, you join humanity in suffering and death. Reveal to all the depth of your love shown on the cross. Accompany all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Restore all who are sick or grieving especially our members, our nursing home and assisted living residents, our homebound members, our military, our friends, families, and enemies, and for those we name out loud or in the silence of our hearts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We await the day of Christ's coming in glory. Lead us by the example of all the saints whom you have called to take up their cross and to follow you especially Tom Carpino, Father Carl Johnson, and Vera Randazzo, that together we may find our lives in you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Lord. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>